Hi Math 215 students. In this video we're going to introduce uh, an important theorem from linear algebra called the Invertible Matrix Theorem. Here is our list of outcomes. Uh, before moving on from this video, please make sure to uh, make sure that you've got some familiarity with these things. We'll display this list as always at the end of the video. So now that we've uh, begun chapter two and we just introduced this idea of the inverse of a matrix, there are a couple questions that are kind of pressing for us. First off, how do we know if a matrix has an inverse? How do we know if it's invertible? And if a matrix A has an inverse, how do we find it? Now that latter question, we've actually seen how to do that. We know how to do this for two by two matrices or, or larger matrices. But the first question is still something that we could say more about. How do we know at the beginning if a matrix has an inverse? Here are a couple questions to help us uh, think a little bit more about this. Uh, go ahead and pause the video if you like, try to answer these questions, and we'll come back with answers in a few. All right, for this first question, we're supposed to find the inverse of negative four, eight, one, negative two, if it exists. And uh, this is a two by two matrix, so we should know how to find the inverse of these. Remember, to find the inverse of a two by two matrix, you want to switch the diagonal entries, change the sign on the, uh, the B and the C entries, and then divide by this quantity, which we call the determinant. And the determinant of this particular matrix is negative four times negative two minus eight times positive one. And that turns out to give us eight minus eight or zero and that's a problem for us because in our formula for the inverse of a two by two matrix, this was supposed to be in the denominator of a fraction. And of course, putting one over zero uh, gives us an undefined quantity. So it turns out that this matrix does not have an inverse. It's not invertible. Now for the second question, for this three by three matrix, uh, we might have a little bit more luck. We can solve this one if we do what we mentioned in the last uh, couple of videos. If we attach an identity matrix onto the right-hand side of this, and if we just start row reducing, trying to push that left-hand half of this matrix to look like the identity matrix, when we're successful, the right-hand side looks like this, and the right-hand side is the inverse to the original matrix. All right, now the question you might run into is, is row reducing the only way to get the, the inverse? or to know if there is an inverse in general. And while we won't say it's the only way to produce an inverse, uh, we wanna talk about this question of how do you know whether a matrix has an inverse or not? Well, row reducing is not the only way to tell whether a matrix has an inverse. There are several different characteristics that uh, matrices having inverses all share. And so what we have here on the screen is the invertible matrix theorem. This is actually, I've labeled it version 1.0 because we'll actually see multiple versions of this invertible matrix theorem as we go throughout our semester. But this is the uh, first one. And uh, what we start with in this theorem is taking a look at a matrix A that is N by N. So it's got the same number of rows as columns. It's a square matrix. And what we're told is that the following statements in this theorem are either all true or all false. So we take a look at the uh, 12 statements here. For the matrix you started with, for A, they're either all true or all false. The first statement, of course, is that A is invertible. So if A is invertible, then the rest of these things have to be true. If A is not invertible, then the rest of these things have to be false as well. Now, this is uh, quite a long theorem. One of the goals of this section is to get you familiar with the different parts of this invertible matrix theorem. It's not necessarily something you'll need to have uh, memorized, but uh, being familiar with the different characteristics will really help. So we're gonna illustrate some of these characteristics in the conceptual questions that follow. Uh, we'll come back to this slide multiple times to take a look at different parts of this theorem. To begin with, um, let's try to answer this question and let's use the invertible matrix theorem to do so. If A is an n by n matrix having two identical columns, then what can we say about the number of solutions to AX equals zero? Now, 
we've got a mention here of the equation ax equals zero. We have mention of two identical columns. It's not necessarily clear what the connection is between these, but if we jump back to the invertible matrix theorem, here is a list of statements. Some of them actually connect to what we've seen. The equation ax equals zero has only the trivial solution. That sounds familiar to the solutions to ax equals zero, uh, the number of them. But then the, um, the columns of A forming a linearly independent set, that seems like that would be connected to this statement that there are two identical columns. And in fact, if the matrix did have two identical columns, we would know that those two columns are not linearly independent. And so statement E would be false. But in the invertible matrix theorem, what we're saying is that all of these statements are, are, are the same. They're either all true or they're all false. So if statement E is false, then that means that statement D would have to be false as well. And so the equation AX equals zero uh, cannot have only the trivial solution. Now the equation AX equals zero always has at least one solution. You can always set X to be the zero vector and it will be true. So if statement D is false, then that would tell us that the number of solutions is more than one. There's more than one solution. Okay, so here's our a summary of our answers. Since statement E was false, the columns were not linearly independent, statement D would also be false, which tells us that AX equals zero does not have only the trivial solution. All right, now, Getting used to these uh, kinds of problems takes a little bit of time, so let's take a look at a second one. If A is an n by n matrix having two identical rows, then what can we say about the columns of A? Now, what does the invertible matrix theorem say about rows? Well, as you span here, it may take a second to find something that seems relevant, but one thing you'll see is that uh, for A to be invertible, a has to have n pivot positions. It has to be row equivalent to the n by n identity matrix. And if we were told that A has two identical rows, maybe you can look ahead and see that when we try to row reduce a matrix that has two identical rows, row reducing it will create a zero row. Uh, we will not get a matrix that's equivalent to the n by n identity matrix. So statement B would be false for this matrix. So then that means that if we're looking at the columns of A, any statement in this list should also be false. And statement E talks about the columns of A. The columns of A form a linearly independent set. That should be false as well. So in other words, if A is a matrix having two identical rows, then the columns of A are not a linearly independent set. Now, that's not necessarily something that you would have been able to deduce automatically from those two uh, bits of information. Um, but it's uh, something that the invertible matrix theorem gives us. And that's why this theorem is so powerful. It connects a wide variety of concepts and it's a list of statements that are either all true or all false. So if you know just one thing about a matrix, a square matrix, then the theorem allows you to conclude an awful lot of other things about that same matrix. All right, let's take a look at uh, some of the other conditions and some of the other ideas in the theorem. If you haven't yet, uh, it would be a good idea to review what it means for a linear transformation to be one-to-one -one and onto. Go ahead and pause the video if you need to look up those definitions again. Okay, but let's take a look at uh, what it means for transformation to be one-to-one -one and onto. You'll remember that one-to-one -one was the condition that if you start with two different inputs to your linear transformation, then they need to end up at different outputs. A uh, one-to-one -one means that you cannot have um, something like this situation. This situation would not be a one-to-one -one situation. Okay. Now, onto, on the other hand, meant that uh, for every point in the uh, place that you're mapping into, we need to have something from the input that maps to there, something from the domain that maps to every place in uh, the set we're mapping into.
Now you can see from this picture that our uh, function maps Rn onto a, a plane which certainly does not fill all the space illustrated here. And so the function, uh, is, the function is definitely not onto. It may be one to one. We, we can't really tell if different things here get sent to the same place over here, but it's definitely not onto because there are lots of points in Rm that are not mapped to from Rn. Okay, now one to one and onto functions make an appearance in the uh, invertible matrix theorem. We'll just point this out. Uh, statement F is the statement that the linear transformation T of X equals AX is a one to one transformation. The statement I is the statement that the linear transformation T of X equals AX maps RN onto RN. Okay, so let's take a look at this. What we're saying here is that if we have a linear transformation from Rn to Rn that is not one-to-one, -one, in other words, it takes two different things from our domain and maps them to the same point in the other set, then what we are guaranteed, since this function is not one-to-one, -one, it's going to be guaranteed not to be onto. There's going to be some point in the other set that is not mapped to by anything in our domain. Okay, so that illustrates just a little bit what uh, statements F and um, statements uh, I have to do with this invertible matrix theorem. Okay, let's take a look at a couple more exercises using the invertible matrix theorem. Is this first matrix invertible? And how could you tell? Now, we could certainly tell by trying to attach this to the right-hand side of an identity matrix and trying to row reduce like we normally would. Um, but let's take a quick look at the invertible matrix theorem and see what that can tell us. A matrix is invertible if and only if it is row equivalent to the n by n in identity matrix. So is it true that this matrix is row equivalent to the identity matrix? Or is it true that that matrix has n pivot positions? You'll notice that the entries of the matrix sort of fit in a triangle in the lower half. We call this a lower triangular matrix. And I believe you'll see, because we have three numbers that are positive, uh, that are not zero on the main diagonal, actually this one is going to be row equivalent to the identity matrix we can sort of scale that first row and then use that entry in the top left corner to cancel out the entries below. Then we can move on to the second row and we can scale the middle entry there and then use it to cancel the entry below it. And so this matrix, because of its form, should be row equivalent to the identity matrix. It should have uh, three pivot positions, one, two, and three, and because of that, what does the invertible matrix theorem say? It tells us that this matrix should be invertible. How about this question? How about the matrix shown here? Is this matrix invertible? How can you tell? Well, one thing you'll notice about this matrix is that it has a column of zeros. And so uh, what can the invertible matrix theorem tell us about columns of zeros? Well, the invertible matrix theorem talks about columns in a couple different places. Statement E talks about columns. The columns of A form a linearly independent set. Now, as we talk about linearly independent sets, the zero vector never belongs to a linearly independent set. And so statement uh, E is false for this matrix which means that all the other statements are false as well. Is this matrix invertible? No, uh, the first statement is that it's invertible. So if that's false, we know definitely that this matrix is not invertible. Okay. Let's take a look at another set of exercises here. Let's suppose that A and I are n by n matrices and if there is an n by n matrix D such that AD equals I, then must there be an n by n matrix C for which CA equals I? Uh, 
justify your answer. All right, so really briefly, we'll just remind you that I stands for the identity matrix. So we're supposing that A is an N by N matrix with the same size as the identity matrix. And we're saying that there is a matrix D so that A times D is the identity matrix. And what we're asking for is whether there has to be uh, an N by N matrix C that you can multiply onto A on the other side of A and also create the identity matrix. Well, as you take a look at these, if you're familiar with the invertible matrix theorem, you may recognize these statements. And we'll, uh, we'll point them out here. Uh, statement J says there is an N by N matrix such that CA is equal to I. That's what we're asking for. Does there have to be such a matrix? Statement K says there is an N by N matrix D such that AD equals I. And remember, in the invertible matrix theorem, these statements are either all true or all false. So if there is a matrix D so that N AD equals I, then there must be a matrix C such that CA equals I. And so the answer to this should be yes. Okay, now in our second question, is it possible for a four by four matrix to have an inverse when its columns do not span Rn? Why or why not? Is it possible for a four by four matrix to have an inverse when its columns do not span Rn? Well, spanning Rn is something that shows up in statement H there. We'll say that a matrix is invertible if and only if its columns span all of Rn. And so our question was, can we have an inverse if the columns do not span Rn? Well, if they don't span Rn, statement H is false, which would mean that every part of this, ma of this uh, invertible matrix theorem should also be false, including the statement that A has an inverse. And so it is impossible for a matrix to have an inverse if its columns don't span Rn. Uh, part A is impossible because we saw already that part H was uh, not true. Okay, with that, we will we'll, um, end our discussion here of the invertible matrix theorem. You will get a little bit of practice in identifying uh, true or false statements based on different uh, facts you know about a given matrix. Just remember that for the invertible matrix theorem, all of these statements are true or all of these statements are false. The same status is, is there for every one of these statements once you have a matrix you're talking about. Okay, with that, we will move to our list of outcomes for the video. You want to be able to define the invertible matrix theorem. Now, note we're not saying that you need to memorize the invertible matrix theorem, but it would be important to recognize uh, statements as, as being parts of the invertible matrix theorem. Please do put a little bit of uh, a little bit of effort into memorizing the concepts involved in the invertible matrix theorem so that if you run into a situation needing a concept, you can easily look up the invertible matrix theorem and find the answer you need. With that, we'll end the video. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next video.